Here. Ann Schaefer is absent. David Allison. Here. And James Weiss. Here. That's a quorum of council. Okay, thank you. So tonight's uh, work session topic is a review of the City of Cordova drug policy. And uh, we have Jennifer Alexander uh, from um, uh, City Council, uh, Corporate Council uh, online to answer questions. So um, Jennifer, did you want to open? Well, I, I, I can, I can. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what, how you would like me to open. I have looked at the city's policy that's been around for quite a long time. So it's probably a good idea that it is being revisited. I Randy made some, Robertson made a few amendments to it a few years back, but generally the policy is one of old. And obviously there are some uh, developments in, in things going on that we, as the council ought to consider. Uh, you know, I can speak to whatever questions people have about policy or how we, you know, want to proceed on to be working consistent with the law. Um, but it is sounds like it is something that it's time for the group to revisit. Okay, um, you may have answered one of the questions, but I'll just remind council and um, participants if um, if council wants to open it up for public comment uh, that this is a policy discussion and not a personnel discussion. So we can't discuss uh, any uh, specific personnel or city personnel or um, so forth. It's just a discussion about uh, the city drug policy and um, whether or not it should be revisited or revised. So uh, I'll open it up to council questions. Councilman Allison. Yeah, uh, Jennifer, this is uh, council member Allison. Um, I guess my my main question at this point in time is, um, you know, hopefully we'll go a review of this stuff later on tonight. But um, my, my main question is, does the current policy leave us open for what, what kind of liabilities does it leave us open to now? I understand no matter what policy you have, you're going to have some liabilities there, but. Um, where should we put this in our priority queue, I guess is what I'm asking. Well, the current policy as it's written sort of attempts to do two things, I, I would say, as I read it. It is attempting to mirror sort of what federal law that was enacted in the 90s um, with regard to what we would call safety sensitive testing. And then in addition to that, I think the efforts Randy um, did a few years back was to sort of clarify that the city's policy with regard to use and misuse would cover all employees as opposed to just employees that would be subject to testing under federal regulations, which is what we're referring to with the safety sensitive employees. And so in terms of liability, I think there's a couple I'm not sure I would call it liability, but there's a couple places where I think it's vulnerability. So there is a drug testing statute under Alaska law that sets up parameters for a drug testing plan that creates some immunities, so to speak, or shields from liabilities if you comply with that, um, the regulations or the, the statute framework. Our policy probably doesn't fully comply with that framework. Again, that doesn't create a liability, but it it takes away a potential immunity of being able to say we relied on the statute. Uh, I would say other vulnerabilities in the policy is it doesn't address with sufficiency, in my mind, certain other things like uh, legal prescription drug use that may also um, subject an individual to impairment if they're using something and how that might be handled by the city. So I would say in that case, the vulnerability is the city doesn't have a good policy um, in, that would cover necessarily those situations. So the, the vulnerabilities are going to be in applying the policy and whether don't think the policy itself isn't going to subject the city to any 
lawsuit, it's going to be how can we apply this policy in certain circumstances if it doesn't cover all the things we need. So I think the vulnerability is the policy doesn't cover all the things we probably want it to. Okay. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Uh, I guess the other question or was and and maybe we'll get into it a little bit later on it though is uh, so basically for for all of these things does the city does our pol does the city's policy in general cover everything that would necessarily be in the union contract and or the DOT um, regulations or requirements or, or do we like basically follow three policies? Well, I believe the city policy was designed at least initially to mirror the DOT um, requirements. It would ha you would have to do a real side-by-side -side comparison and the policies might be with the regs to see if they're still closely mirrored, but the ultimate testing that's done through the DOT um, would be compliant because it's done, you know, there's a standard DOT testing. So the policy itself, I think, in terms of describing when testing is required or when it may be uh, invoked is consistent, whether the, each, the references to the regs or whether the levels and whether the um, substance is tested for, I doubt that's actually consistent with federal regulations. And in terms of the union contract, the union um, agreement allows, the, there isn't a specific drug testing policy in the CBA, it's the CBA, the union adheres to the, what the city determines as the policy. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. So Jennifer, um, <clears throat> it's Clay. So uh, regardless of the city policy though, there are still safety sensitive positions that fall under the current federal policy regardless. So even if the city didn't have a policy or had like a don't ask, don't tell policy, there's still gonna be certain employees covered under federal um, drug policy, right? Presumably. I mean, I don't know every city employee's job, but there are certain positions that federal government would say subject, are subject to federal DOT testing requirements, regardless of whether we had a word on a piece of paper that was a policy. And, and we would have to, for those employees that would be subject, assuming there are some, to federal DOT policy, we would have to comply with those federal regulations with regard to those employees. Okay. Uh, other questions, council? Uh, Councilman Jones. Yeah, I guess I've got a question for Susan first and then for council, um, legal counsel after Jennifer. Um, Susan, I was curious, um, in bringing this work session before us, how, how was the process there? I, I just saw one email, wasn't on any pending agenda. Um, did the mayor elect to bring this before us or was this no, something I that- No, I thought it was two before? council members. I can't remember now if it was at a pending agenda or was it in an email? It was in an email and then when I came and talked to you, you said there was- I know, who was the second? Was it you? Yeah. So I was curious who the two council, council members, it members was two were. Council members. And it was going to be an agenda item and then we thought the agenda was full and we didn't have anything for the work session tonight. So I guess three of us decided to make it the work session instead. Okay, and then the other question I would have for legal counsel would be, um, if one of those two council members was the sole holder of a marijuana dispensary license in the community of Cordova, would this not be a conflict of interest to have them bring the drug policy in front of us? Well, you're probably asking the wrong council. I will give you my qualified response, which is that um, in that the best person to answer this question is probably Holly. But I think when looking at a conflict of interest, you would look at it to whether there's um, the potential for financial gain and discussion of a policy or change in policy. Um, 
I don't think unless there was a, a direct articulatable financial gain that a council member who might um, have that business would necessarily be a conflict. So, you know, it, it would be like to allow to the council decide to um, discuss the licensing policies wherein maybe some more people in the city are able to get licensing for a vehicle. I wouldn't necessarily think that would be a conflict for the entity that sold vehicles. I think you would have to, uh, there would have to be a direct conflict of interest that you can articulate that shows a financial interest. And I think a discussion at least um, of policy and even proposed changes to the policy that don't have a direct financial interest wouldn't create a conflict. But I, I do suppose that certain circumstances, certain policy provisions, I suppose, could, in theory, create that. And at that time, I think the uh, council member would not be able to vote on the implementation of that. Maybe I could say something to clear that up, too, is I currently don't hold a license. I think I've been very clear about my plan, but right now I don't currently hold a license. So. Maybe I just add that to what has already been said. Councilman Jones, oh Jeff, another question. Well, I mean, you were granted a license from the city, just not the state, correct? I don't hold any license. Okay, so that. Okay. It's a plan. I've been very open about the plan. Just... Other questions, Council, or? Thoughts, I think the purpose of the work session, part of the purpose of the work session is to decide if um, you wanna make this a priority and put it on agenda or direct staff to, you know, look at revising the policy or. Um, if, if anyone wants to have a look at page seven under uh, categories of employment, employees subject to testing, I think it's pretty reasonable policy for someone performing in safety sensitive functions of the city to be a subject or a person who may be required to operate a motor vehicle through their job or a public safety. But I think these, I feel like our, our policies are pretty binding from, from other entities. We really try to avoid going outside of that. Um, I, yeah, if, uh, if there's, if there's, I, I think there's some jobs that that uh, maybe, maybe you can use a different substance and still able to do, but I, I think there's some some very safety related jobs out there that, that uh, you wanna make sure uh, your employees are, are actually doing Um, well, I, I did bring this forward and wanted to discuss it and did some research on it. And I, I understand that we have regulations that we need to follow the DOT testing. I don't think that that's requirements we should use for all employees. I think that we should have a couple of different policies if that's how it's, it is right now. Um, how it's being handled federally, things are changing and things that have happened for our state have changed. And I think that policies and um, these guidelines and regulations are gonna take a while to catch up with the changing laws that are coming. Um, I have kind of a, haven't had a clear answer with the limits that they test for these substances that come up. Um, and I think it's something that the DOT hasn't really researched or addressed in their cutoff limits that they set for these tests um, to make the distinction between marijuana and hemp CBD type products. What they test for from what I can see is a very small limit and hemp is classified under that um, and there's trace amounts of THC and it can and has been shown on some drug tests. And I don't think that the labs or the regulations have 
kind of distinguish the two like they have with other drugs so that when you're taking prescription drugs that it doesn't come up as a different substance that you're not taking. I don't know the best way to go about it. I think a bunch of cities and states are trying to figure out how to do this. But I think if we could have a couple different plans so that we're the employees that have to follow under the DOT testing regulations are tested in that manner, and then the employees that aren't, um, I think we should have a different policy. I would be in favor of taking off green marijuana in general, um, but if we want to look at maybe a different testing that tests for a larger amount, so you're actually getting separating the two between CBD and marijuana, because I think right now it's not clear which substance they're using. That's clear. Other thoughts, Council? Uh, Councilman Jones? Well, I guess I would have another question for Susan. Do we currently have any sort of drug testing policies for members of city council or mayor? I guess that, that would be the only change I would like to see is hold ourselves to the same standards we hold our employees. I don't think it's very fair to us. To, uh, to require things of our employees that we're not willing to adhere to ourselves. So if we're gonna be looking at making a change, I would, I would add us to the same policy. Not really your employees. Mm -hmm. The city's employees. The city's employees. Never heard of that. <clears throat> that's, what the, that's what the CEC board said when they implemented their policy. They said they were serious enough about it that they were willing to include the um, CEC board as a policy. They didn't. Other uh, Councilman Allison. Yeah, I guess I, I would be interested in in plugging the known vulnerabilities that that Jennifer has mentioned. Um, as far as a complete rewrite of, of this, I, I think staff has been looking, staff and the attorneys for that matter, I guess, have been looking at it for several years uh, at this title uh, in our in our uh, charter or charter code, in our code. And, uh, and I think that's ongoing. I'm not sure where we're, where we're at with that, but, um, I think it'd be pretty easy probably to plug the vulnerabilities that Jennifer asked about. Um, but I guess I'm not too interested in a, in a complete rewrite a, a, except in, in conjunction with um, the rewrite of Title IV. My thoughts anyway. Um, Manager Lennon. Jennifer, the the tip of the spear for all of this is kind of Colorado, am I, am I correct? In that they were the first? Well, just, or... just, just sort of the progression of the system uh, has advanced pretty far in, in Colorado. And um, I know that, I think I've read that they've set testing limits for operating vehicles um, a variety of things and you know how are how are they handling all of this because this this certainly isn't a vacuum well to the extent i know which is you know limited to my own sort of research and i am following cases that are trying to address some of these issues that come up again the for the federal DOT, it is what it is, and there isn't anything. There's a few exceptions the um, divisions of a state might have to be able to determine whether someone's safety sensitive or not or um, plant their own testing, but they're very limited, and we would have to look at those in with real specificity. But generally speaking, the federal DOT guidelines apply to those employees and there isn't any changing. With regard to other employees, the city is entitled to establish the policies and the substances that it wants to test for. So, um, you know, you do have some leeway to 
if you wanted to take marijuana or opioids or something out of the mix, that's something you can do. Um, I think the some of the issues that other states are grappling with, including Colorado and Maine, and is how you factor in medical marijuana, um, and that, but that really becomes a disability analysis as opposed to a testing. And I think a lot of the bigger issues are how you deal with prescription use, um, even if it's permitted and, and authorized by a physician, whether there's an impairment there, how you identify um, and make decisions whether to send somebody to testing if you're doing it based on suspicion um, and of an impairment. And as Melina said, one of the challenges with marijuana is, to my knowledge, there is uh, very little accuracy in a sample testing that identifies impairment. So you have different issues. So um, whether or not there is a more appropriate level to test for marijuana and whether some um, employers in some states are looking to that, I don't know. It's all science to me and I don't know the difference between 50 nanograms and 500 what's it. So, um, I have yet to see, though, any indication that there is um, testing that has been accepted to identify impairment for marijuana. Um, I think the other issues that um, come up with drug testing really have more to do with uh, the city's responsibility to its citizens and people who might it's employees that, that are co-workers and whether there's an obligation to attempt to create a substance-free and safe workplace. So the issue, type of issues that come up, you know, relate to what are the city's liabilities if somebody is involved in an accident and is impaired with some substance, some substance and the city didn't follow testing protocols. Um, or should have had testing but didn't. I mean, that's the argument, you know, one would make is, well, you should have tested these individuals. They perform functions that could have created harm and you didn't have any kind of testing policy. Therefore, you should have some liability. So there's some of those issues that compete with the sort of rights of the individuals um, that we have to look for. And I think I was sharing this with Alan uh, a while back. There is a, there's an elastic case that, um, you know, finds significant liability against laid law school bus for a bus driver who was using marijuana. And they basically found that the fact that the bus driver chose to use marijuana before driving was within the course and scope of her employment and therefore the city was liable. And it didn't didn't hinge on whether they had a testing policy or whether they had a, a drug or alcohol policy. It simply was, you bought it. Um, the driver smoked it, you bought it. So I think there are a lot of different goals that try to be accomplished with the testing, whether it's, you know, putting employees on notice, ferreting out drug use, giving supervisors and managers a mechanism to deal with an employee they think is impaired. And I think there's also that issue of trying to um, limit liability or behave in a way that's in good faith so that you are trying to minimize potential hazards and harm. So they, the policies themselves attempt to accomplish all kinds of things. So, uh, Jennifer. Well, obviously more effectively than others. Okay. Uh, Jennifer, this Clay. Um, so the federal guidelines, though, have uh, limits, set limits for marijuana and other controlled substances. They do. Okay. And when I say controlled, I mean by DOT regulations. Okay, so, um, so to kind of. And I know they've recently changed. Um, I think they just actually have changed a little bit this month. Mm -hmm. um, 
in that they've changed what they're testing for and, and, and I don't know if they've changed the numbers for any items and like as I said, it wouldn't really mean much to me what those numbers are, but um, that's, that is a change to the regulations. I believe they've added some um, substances to the panel that they now test for. Yeah. So the um, so to kind of summarize what I've heard from council so far, um, I've heard some council kind of lean towards um, in it. And so if I'm if I understand right now, um, Jennifer, do you know? You said Randy had made some amendments. Do you know if the current policy includes all city employees for testing? Yes. The current policy includes all city employees um, as it relates to um, post-accident testing. So I guess, um, and I would say post-accident testing or sort of what I would call suspicion testing. It does not apply, there's no random testing that applies to other all city employees okay. that aren't in safety sensitive functions. Okay. So what I've heard from council so far is some um, are um, interested in relaxing the policy to um, only include uh, safety sensitive positions. I'm hearing um, council, some council interested in expanding to include even, even council and mayor. And I'm hearing other uh, council feedback to at least um, revise the policy um, in the context of um, updating policy for Article 4 um, personnel policy uh, to at least um, plug some of the vulnerabilities. So I think that's where the discussion is so far. So in the context of testing limits, you know, there's several options. You can, um, if the uh, testing policy applies to, or controlled substance policy applies to all employees, then you can adopt those federal limits um, for all employees and any future modifications. I've seen that in policies. Uh, so if the federal policy is changed to, in, to reduce or increase the amount of substances and which substances, um, in other words, which substances count as controlled substances and the limits, uh, testing limits of those, then you can just have that built into your policy. And, um, then, so from a policy perspective, from council, it's I think it boils down to will boil down to what is what does council as a group want? You know, to uh, expand the policy to include more employees or restrict it to safety sensitive, and then um, then there's all kinds of elements of the policy that include can include supervisor training to identify. It can require employees to uh, notify a supervisor if they're on a prescription so that the supervisor can have the opportunity to maybe modify their duties if they're safety sensitive or you know leave and all kinds of options. So there's a lot of details, but as uh, Manager Lanning pointed out, this um, it's not something you necessarily have to start from scratch on. Can I ask another question? Jennifer, if I get it correctly, um, that's where you were saying the, the uh, bus driver case, um, the city owned liability regardless? It wasn't the city, it was the, it was Laidlaw who obviously is a contractor for school districts, but they, it was an interesting case from an employment employer's perspective because they found that the driver's use of marijuana before driving was um, in the course and scope of her employment as opposed to being able to say, that doesn't involve us at all, this is something she did on her own time. They found that her decision to, to use marijuana and drive um, was within the course and scope and therefore they attached the liability to, to the company. Um, it's just, I'm not sure it, I only share it to point out, I guess, that there are, you know, legitimate concerns that employers have to balance with uh, privacy rights and things that they want to permit for their employees because 
there's the potential liability attached at the other end. Now, to be fair, a, a bus driver is always, always, always going to be a DOT. They would have, that person would have been subject to random testing. Um, presumably, they complied with the testing procedures during um, this. It was just simply a matter of the court saying, this is, you're strictly liable for this accident and the injuries caused to those, the children who were on the bus. So um, again, I, I only use it to illustrate that the city has to consider the whole big picture of potential liabilities when um, they choose to implement testing or not implement testing. And again, even with a policy, which I'm sure laid law had, it didn't necessarily solve that issue. That was my point as well. My risk management brain kind of works like this. The, the federal limit is 15. We as a city say, oh, um, we, we're okay with it being 10. First of all, the person using it cannot control the amount of, they can't, they can't regulate their intake, so they don't know what happens. They don't know where they're at afterwards. So they have an accident of any kind, perhaps a serious accident, and they test and they're at eight. What happens? I mean, because it doesn't seem to me that, particularly when you're someone who is well covered from an insurance standpoint and you have deep pockets, that the liability risk only increases rather than dissipates under the circumstances. So the limit of 10 is not going to help you. It'd be like saying a police officer went through an intersection at 120 miles an hour and killed a family, but they were only 0 .6, .06 with alcohol rather than 0 .08. Am I reading that right or does, does that not make any difference? Well, I, I think, you know, it depends on what, we're, what kind of substance we're talking about because for a number of substance, I believe that there is a correlation between the percentage or the number and what is recognized as an impairment. And if, for example, we take alcohol, um, a number of, you know, we've watched that number change, mostly go down across the country as scientists have decided that, you know, you're able to discern impairment at various levels. Again, one of the challenges with marijuana is um, you could have somebody test significantly over the level that is the floor for the testing and have not smoked marijuana for weeks. Hmm. So it, it, that correlation is very is difficult at this time to sort of ascertain whether somebody's impaired. And that's always going to be the challenge. And I think to the extent you have um, an event where somebody is test positive for marijuana, the test itself might be a violation of the policy and the test might be evidence or inference that the person was impaired. But I think the other evidence is going to be necessary. They're going to show is that there was other evidence that the person was impaired, um, visible evidence, that kind of thing, behavioral evidence. <laughs> so I think from a liability standpoint, to try to, I don't think that the testing limits that we, we come up with or that we rely on from the feds are necessarily the going to be the thing that either protects us for liability or creates additional risk. Uh, it, to me, it's going to be, you know, do we have a policy? Is this policy reasonable in its efforts to discern inappropriate substance use and abuse in the workplace? Are we adhering to the policy? that kind of thing as a, in terms of have we mitigated our risk as opposed to focusing on the level. 
So from a policy standpoint, Jennifer, though, that, that testing threshold is what, um, for instance, if you have a zero tolerance policy and a um, exceeding the test limit um, can result in discipline, uh, including termination, um, if they test below those thresholds, then probably going to be hard to, uh, you know, pr prevail on a, on a discipline case or um, Correct. whereas. For example, if, if you have a testing limit that says, you know, if you, if you blow uh, over 08 for alcohol, you know, you're terminated and you have somebody who blows 07 and you terminate them, I think that's problematic. I don't think. Now, you may have viewed them to be impaired. You may, there may be other reasons that support a termination, but, or a disciplinary action, but the sheer number isn't going to be, it's going to be below the threshold and you're going to have to have another reason. And the whole point of the threshold, I would argue if I was representing an employee in one of those cases, is to set a, a clear bar. And so I think that where, wherever you set the bar, if you want to say have a zero tolerance policy, then above that bar is is the zero tolerance, and below it is simply not. But maybe, and again, I say maybe there are other factors that support a decision, even if it's below the testing. But I do think that's why it's important to. It, to me, it's the application of the policy, and I think it's it's you know consideration. Um, you know, a lot of alcohol policies, for example, will be 0.04 as opposed to the legal limit for driving because the, you know, the employer's position is that no alcohol is accepted, acceptable at the workplace, not just enough to not be drunk, too drunk to drive. Hey, um, other um, questions or input, counsel? Um, yeah, I guess I wanted to make up the point, too, that I wasn't talking about taking off marijuana or changing the limits um, for all employees. I think that there's definitely public safety, people that are driving, even people just driving the vehicles, city cars, I think, maybe should be under the DOT laws. I just wanted to take a look at it, and maybe employees that don't need to meet those federal rates regulations shouldn't be subject to something that they do on their off time. Um, if they're at work, that's a completely different thing. I mean, someone could be taking uh, medicine that they're prescribed to and aren't able to function and doing their job at work. And I think that's something that would have to be addressed um, just the same. Um, and I don't know, I just, I think that we should look at our drug policy a little bit more. I'm not in favor of no tolerance. I would like to look at the return to duty um, part as well so that we can keep employees and not just terminate them. Um, the no tolerance, uh, I think there's a return to duty for alcohol and it should be for other substances as well. Continuing testing or a way to fix the problem. So I think um, we've got quite a bit of time here, but um, what I am hearing um, unanimous um, feedback from council is that you want the policy revisited. And uh, I'll just, um, I'm just gonna share something about policy formation that um, when I went to um, newly elected officers training at Alaska Municipal League uh, and uh, when I was on city council, they, um, they mentioned that um, they had a, a framework for the difference between, um, you know, the management and uh, administer, you know, administerial part of the job, which is Alan's bailiwick, and then policy setting and the governance role, and that's so what council's responsibility was. And I like the way they um, laid it out: is that um, council considers and adopts policy, and that um, staff. Um, recommends, interprets, and administers policy. So what that means is council kind of says, here's, here's what we want the, here's what we want to accomplish. This is the kind of um, culture environment we want for the city uh, government. And, um, and then Alan staff's job is to take that and say, okay, here's where, here's where council wants to go, wants his policy to take us. 
but they're the ones who actually have to, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, apply that policy to the day-to-day -day business. And there's a lot of things that come up on the um, you know, administrative side that council doesn't see. So, so when the advice from AML is that management um, recommends policy, that's because management is often the ones that see where the breakdowns are, where the problems are, because they're the ones who actually have to use the policy on a day-to-day -day basis. So usually the structure is management brings policy to council says, hey, we, we've got a problem here um, that uh, this policy we have in place is outdated or hasn't kept up or uh, we have vulnerabilities in, or you know their personnel policy doesn't uh, create a fair or a safe or a supportive or rewarding or, um, or uh, productive workplace. So here's some recommended changes. So I'm just laying that out as, as a suggestion for council. So um, as you consider where to go with this, if you want to um, direct um, manager to consider revisions, it might kind of be in the, uh, it might be, since there's a broad perspective on, on you know, where who you want to include it in it, um, if you kind of look at a policy level of what you want the, it to accomplish and how you want it to serve Cordova, um, it might be good with uh, to let the manager kind of, um, or if you want to direct the manager to revise the policy, to kind of get the feedback on, um, you know, a draft, for example, and why the draft is structured like it is, and some of the things to consider in the policy. So that might just be a suggestion. In other words, if, if council wants to direct the manager to revise this policy, maybe in the context of uh, Title IV personnel policy, and then um, at some point you're gonna have to have something to look at that's different than this. So then he could bring that back with maybe an um, uh, explanation of which elements he recommends changing and why. And um, that makes sense. And then if you want to provide any direction on what your thoughts on where you want the policy to, um, you know, to take you as far as, you know, the employees or the citizens are concerned. And or um, you've got 20 minutes here, and there are a lot of people in the public. If you want to open it up for some public input, and um, is that council's will? Or? I'm interested in both. Yeah. The... Okay. Do you have any more comments before I do that? Or? Yeah, I, I'll just go on. Yeah, I would just say if we were if we were interested in someone like just just for example, if we had an employee that. They wanted the UCB oil for to treat arthritis or something like that or anxiety. You know, these things can all these all these things usually say go to a doctor, get a doctor recommendation. And that's under our controlled substance policies, right? Right here in resolution 91-53. Um, and then maybe perhaps if you develop uh, a level, I don't know if that would interfere or clash with the federal law, you know, for people that aren't operating equipment or aren't involved in safety things. But I'll just add this, that we don't have a dispensary in Cordova. We don't have, you know, nothing, no marijuana in Cordova is tested or, or anything like that if it's here. It's coming here legally. It's not, you know, it's unregulated. And then, until we have that, we don't really have any business revising that because people don't know what they're putting in their body. But, but these CBD oils that are coming out, they can, I, I'm sure they're like for their THC content or what, what's coming out, but they can bring this to a doctor. And they can they can have someone review with this is, and get a recommendation on whether they're not or not to use it. But, but I'm not really interested in dumping marijuana and see if we have products that aren't tested. I think that's what we want to sponsor. Any other council comments? So um, I just mentioned, I, I know there, so we'll open it up for public comment if you just want to um, approach the microphone and state your name and um, residence. And also there's a lot of city employees. So if you're a city employee, you just may want to um, clarify for the record whether you're speaking as a city employee or just as a general public. So, uh, yeah. Dave Gleason, 609 Cedar Street. Um, 
most of my comments were covered by council, but I would say that um, alcohol has been legal for a long time. They still test for alcohol. Um, I know marijuana is legal in the state, but um, I think that as a city employee, you're representing the city. We hold them to a higher standard than a fisherman or you know, a carpenter or other jobs like that because they're dealing with the public. Um, and it's a tough call because marijuana is legal, but you have to make the choice. It's a personal choice. It's a condition of employment for the city of Cordova to not do drugs. So you have to choose. Do I want to do drugs or do I want the job? And I don't think you should ever lower your standards there. It's 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 not really that high of a bar. So I would be interested if they had a test that differentiated between that CDV oil and marijuana. If they could come up with something like that, I could see uh, something like that. But taking marijuana out of the drug testing, I think is, is not a good move. I don't think that's a good idea at all. Um, CTC, they, their drivers, all their employees, drug tested. Um, they just want to hold them to that standard. Um, you know, you're dealing with the public. So um, you're also being paid by the taxpayers of the public. So we just have that expectation. And um, that's my opinion on that. Oh, and I would say CDL drivers are the big federally regulated one, but it sounded like Councilman Meyer was not interested in taking them off, but they are federally regulated. All 50 states have to comply. Every employer has to comply. So there's, like council said, there's no change in that. Um, and they have, and, and to have them held at that high standard is, is terrific. It's, it would be hard to separate the other employees from what, you know, you're, you've got your pool of employees and you say, these guys are held to this standard and these guys aren't that would be tough to accomplish. I think you would have some upset employees if you tried to do something like that. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. This is my favorite thing. You guys know that, right? <laughs> my name is Penelope Oswald. I'm at 240 EAC Drive. I have a couple of issues with this policy that I would like to see addressed. I'll make a brief comment on CBD oils. They're huge. They're becoming more and more prolific as time goes by. They're over the counter. They are not prescription. Your policy only refers to prescription, something prescribed by a doctor. These are not prescribed by a doctor, but they are showing to prove effective in treating arthritis, anxiety, and other disorders. To the best of my knowledge, the only one at this point in time that has been made legal by the federal government is that one that addresses epilepsy. The others are still waiting to be confirmed or not confirmed at that point in time. Um, the standards that, I, that I've been reading on is like the initial test is 50 NGs and the confirmation test is 15. Again, which was brought up by your attorney, at 15 NG, you don't have an idea of what that, whether that impairs your employee or not. The goal here is to have great employees for the city of Cordova to make sure they're healthy and happy. And I don't think they, I think they should be able to take things that will help them that aren't prescribed by pharmaceuticals. So I believe in CBDs. I think that we should change this policy to accommodate CBD oils and other things like that and modify the prescription only in this policy. I also feel that my biggest problem, and I've read through the whole thing, is they talk about initial testing. They vaguely talk about second testing. Somewhere in the way back in page 22, they talk about rehab and re rehabilitation. For our employees, these are our investment in Cordova. These are our people. And some good employees are hard to find. So when you've got an employee that um, 
is unbeknownst to them taking a product that is going to cause a test that they previously never tested positive for. I believe that the city should recognize that there should be a second test, a review, a reconciliation with the employee and a remediation. I mean, I don't, I can't believe it's not in there. You know, I mean, it can be for long-term employees, somebody over five years, over 10, or even over the probation mark. But at some point in time, you have to recognize your employees and the citizens that they are and what they've done to the community. So I really think that that needs to be included in this packet at some point in time. Okay. Thank you. So we've got about 10 minutes left on the um, public, uh, I'm sorry, the council work session and um, on the drug policy, city drug policy, and uh, council's open it up to public comment. Uh, just a reminder, it's a policy discussion and not, not a personnel discussion. Hi, Don Baylor, 304. Okay, I'm gonna try it. <clears throat> I've tried the CBD oil and the creams and I found them to be ineffective, but they don't work for everybody. Um, but for those that they do work for, it, it's great. Um, I don't think you should lower your standards. The reason why I have as many drunk drivers on the roads is the standards got tougher. I was just reading an article that that limit's gonna come down some more. I can't remember what state it was. Mr. Hicks could tell you, but they lowered it to the point something and the rest of the country's gonna follow. So you'll have less young drivers. Uh, I think pot's the same way. I think the direction you should go is find the text testing company that can discern the, the CBD. And that my, I was reading up a little bit on this and I looked just searching for the e email. There was a company that discussed it and if they got a positive test, they then went back and retested it and they had a way of finding out if, this, if the CBD was causing it. You know? There's a lot of stuff on the internet, but I think that's the approach you should take. Because I agree, if you can limit the, if you can eliminate the CBD positive, I don't think that uh, your, your limits are good. I'd leave it alone. But that's where your focus should be. Not on, everybody deserves the right to work in a drug-free workplace. I don't care if you're watering the flowers or driving the snow plow. And having worked in construction for years and, and being around guys I know smoke the joint in the morning and one in the afternoon, it's it's tough to be around that. And when I got older, I could get away with it. And it's even tougher when you're paying somebody and you're doing it. So don't let, don't lessen your standards, but look at the, how can we test the CBD? Is there a test out there? That's where my focus is. All right, thank you. Thank you. So I think in your policy, there is, if you get, I thought I read in this, if you get a positive test you have, 79 hours or 29 hours, you have you have a right for a retest. 72 hours. 72 hours. The same sample. They hold that same sample for 365 days. Yeah, there you go. So there is a second test, right? Or is it just it's second request? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Hey. Other uh, public comment? Council? Uh, Councilman Allison. Yeah, I guess just to, to summarize my my thoughts on it, uh, and, and I think uh, Manager Lanning and, and maybe Jennifer covered it uh, a little bit. Is I just we need to err on the side of of caution and safety. Um, wouldn't take very long for our permanent flood to be nothing uh, if we allowed a couple of. Um, couple of things to happen that they shouldn't. Um, so I, I just think that conservative caution um, needs to be where where I would be um, focusing if, if we could, whatever we can do and, and still keep everybody safe, uh, both the, the operators and and the, their coworkers, then, then I'm all for it, but uh, we we have to we have to reduce our liabilities and our vulnerabilities as much as possible. Councilman Meyer, um, I think I've kind of just played on both on the CBD oil products that are coming out and um, marijuana. 
I understand that it's probably not going to be popular to allow employees to use marijuana on their off time because of the standards and stuff, and that's not exactly where I'm going with this. Um, but I do think that CBD is something that they should be allowed to take. And what that comes up in the positives is there's trace amounts of um, THC. So you can get a bottle that says 0% THC, but if there's 0.03% THC in there, that's still 0%. It's 0 0.3. It just doesn't have the decimals after that. So when um, I was talking about the limits about marijuana, um, it that's what it's coming up for them. Even if they're taking CBD, it says CBD, it says 0% CBD, it's still considered hemp, and it's made from hemp, when, but there can be trace amounts of THC because it comes from the uh, cannabis plant, and cannabis plants have THC in it. I don't know that there's a test to um, distinguish between the two, I don't think that there's been a lot of research of understanding where the levels are and where they're at right now. I don't, I don't know, and I don't think other people know. I've tried to research it, you know, try not to just look at articles, but look at actual data, and I don't see that there's a lot of data on it. It would be nice if some scientists and people that know about these limits did test it and look at it. Um, I'm not one, <laughs> but. I think for these positions that don't fall under the federal requirement that we should have some more leeway to account for these CBD products that are entering the market because they're entering fast. People see that it says zero THC. They think that they have a job, that they have drug tests, and they think they can take it, and nothing's telling them that they can't really, and they do. And then if they have trace amounts, especially if they're using it every day, I don't know what that does to your limits. You're taking it ingested rather than a cream that's on you. Cream might not show up positive because you're not ingesting it, but I think that we need to look at this and if there's positions that don't have public safety, that are not driving cars around, that we should have more tolerance for these products that are just not a lot of research is on them. Uh, Councilman Jones. Um, well, I guess I would start off by um, Councilmember Meyer mentioned earlier that, you know, she's not pushing for allowing employees to of the city to use marijuana, but 15, 20 minutes ago, she said just that. Also, in our current policies, um, we don't test all employees randomly. We only test the ones that drive vehicles and have public safety. It's right here in our policies. So as far as changing anything, I'm not sure what changes she would be talking about because we don't randomly test all of the employees. We only test the ones in public safety and we only test the ones that are uh, operating motorized vehicles uh, randomly. We test everybody upon them, you know, employment. But after that, the random policy is just for those two things she just listed. So. Um, third, the only change that I would like to see would be expanding this to encompass everybody and all appointed and elected positions. I think that if we're going to hold our city employees to a standard, we should be able to hold ourselves to the same standard. Okay. Um, in the last couple of minutes here, Council, and I've um, worked with Susan on this a little bit. Sometimes we get hung up at the pending agenda part of the, uh, uh, because we kind of have, we kind of brainstorm about what to put on the um, coming agendas and how. And so to kind of help facilitate uh, more orderly meetings, um, this is a work session about this. I think I'm hearing unanimously from you four Council that you'd like to see this um, policy reviewed and um, revised and uh, maybe in the context of uh, Title IV. So I would suggest you just have a, um, an action item on the agenda to um, review drug policy. And then you can um, uh, direct the manager, you know, it'll be a vote of the council on, on a coming agenda to direct the manager to review the um, drug policy and or more broadly uh, Title IV. 
I would, go ahead. I mean, I would say in the context of reviewing it for relaxing it, I would be vehemently opposed to relaxing any of our current drug policies. So if that's what type of direction you were trying to give the manager, I, I would. Well, no, I'm, I'm just saying we put it on the agenda to review the drug policy and then council debates that, amends it if they want, comes to consensus votes on it, and then you give the direction of the manager. But that's that's the discussion that comes up in the debate. You know, I mean, we know there's, it sounds like there's councilmen on different sides of it, so. Um, but I think it's important that council decide whether or not to review it because that's gonna consume city resources. You've got other things in a, you know, in your, um, strategic plan and that's the first step is just directing the manager to review it and if there's certain things you want to consider you can pass that on that time so I, I think we you know often there are actions taken in response to something that happens and that's always the catalyst yeah but if you but if you look back and on pages 14 and 15 of the last year's budget you know, we talked about under infrastructure, one of our priorities was code review of chapter four. Under internal services, we talked about a review of chapter four. And in the strategic work plan for 18, it was a review of chapter four. So I, I don't think um, there's any deference to, to reviewing the policy, but I would just argue that we should do it in, the, we need to do it in the context of chapter four as obviously personnel is one of the areas where you're most exposed to liability. So we've been advocating that for a couple of years now and I just think that, that would be the direction it goes to do the whole thing comprehensively, including this policy as part of it. And of course, we, we obviously need to know the cost. Of that. Yeah, that would be my recommendation to council as well. And it's just like the borough discussion that was borough formation was something that you identified in the strategic plan as something that you should review at some point. Then you have a catalyst of someone else conducting a study of Prince William Sound. And so as a council, you say, well, maybe now's the time to kind of move that up sooner in our three year plan and do that review and answer that question or meet that strategic goal. And then you're kind of working within the parameters of your strategic plan. So um, any, Final comments, Council, before we wrap up? Or... Okay, hearing none, I'll adjourn the um, work session.
second council meeting of January 16th uh, to order. And uh, if you join me in, um, first, I'm actually gonna ask you to join me in a moment of silence. There was kind of a tragic accident over the holidays in Skagway, lost their mayor. So I guess just to extend our condolences to that community, we'll just have a moment of silence. If you join me in pledging the flag, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Copeland. Here. James Burton is absent. Ben Jones. Here. Jeff Barr is absent. Lynn Meyer. Here. David Allison. Here. Here. Okay, uh, council, uh, under approval of agenda, I'm just gonna recommend since you do have a quorum, but since it's kind of light, uh, when we get to the uh, action items, if you're uncomfortable with just for council approving those, um, I just recommend that you move to postpone that item till the next regular meeting. So uh, approval of agenda, uh, Councilman Allison. I move to approve the re regular agenda with the following exception, removing item Q, executive session for the city clerk's evaluation. Since there's only four of us here, I think it's more important to do that with, you know, we don't have to vote with four, but um, more important to do that evaluation with more of a full council. Okay, so there's a motion to amend the agenda in a second. Okay. Um, I think he moved to approve it, removing that. Okay, and then you approve the agenda that. with that modification. Okay. Um, all those in favor of approving the agenda as amended? Aye, aye, aye. Opposed? Okay. Agenda is approved without the regular, uh, without the executive session. Um, does council have any conflicts of interest to disclose? Okay, seeing none. Uh, under communications by and petitions of visitors, I believe uh, Manager Lanning, you had an introduction you'd like to do? I, I would just like to have Dean Baugh come up for a moment. He's our interim finance director. Uh, we hired him, well, we, we hired a large recruiting firm. We, we sought from a large recruiting firm that recommended Dean for our disposal for six months, and he will be here for six months and six months only, because he's actually gonna retire someday. Uh, ah. Dean's, Dean's delving into things, and uh, we're, we're very glad to have him here, and we think he'll do a great job for us over the next six months, at which time we'll do a permanent recruitment. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome to Cordova. Any other questions come up? All right, thanks. Welcome, Dean. Uh -huh. Okay, um, chairpersons and representatives of boards and commissions, uh, CCMC. Good evening. Oh, I'm sorry, I did. I skipped the audience comments regarding agenda items. I apologize, Scott. No problem. I, um, I guess I need to come to grips with my need for reading glasses. <laughs> <laughs> the optometrist doesn't get here for another month, so uh, audience comments on agenda items, and if you could just state your name and residence for the uh, uh, record, please. Um, thank you, Councilman uh, Coplin. Um, I'm actually a former resident of Cordova, um, and I'm here uh, as vice chairman at Chugach, Alaska, and I wanted to, um, I, I know that the, the council has a resolution 918 of 26 um, that you guys are looking at a review um, showing potential opposition of a PWS borough. <clears throat> and on the agenda item, I just want to, and I came here last, uh, at the last meeting to kind of express concerns from your friends and neighbors within the Prince William Sound. Mm -hmm. And today I've brought op opposition letters um, from those communities signed by many of their boards and their chairmen. Um, they're from the Chugach. In fact, the Chugach School District um, wanted me to share with this body that they're currently voting on an opposition letter today. 
and I should have that signed letter and I can share it with your, your city clerk if you'd like. Okay. Um, yeah, we can enter those into correspondence and they'll go in the next uh, packet. So. Okay, and then just in my three minutes, I have, I'll have i just briefly discuss what I have in here and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, move on and I appreciate it. Okay, you bet. Um, we also have opposition letters from Chugach Alaska Corp, Tatillik Village IRA Council, uh, Tatillik Corp, Native Village of, of Chiniga, Chiniga Corp, and uh, Chugach Mute. Uh, lo recently, uh, the local boundary commission uh, also put together a report uh, uh, with the state advocating uh, the potential idea of this borough. And there were a lot of misleading information um, that were slanted towards there being support we actually have not seen one community come forward in support of that, um, uh, uh, this borough. And there are several letters from these communities um, that went to the Boundary Commission to, to update them just to have a more, more informed report. So I provided that to you. Okay. Um, but in conclusion, I just wanted to highlight some themes that, that most of the communities have expressed in these letters. Um, one is they're very concerned about their independence as a community to be able to manage and govern their own communities. Uh, they also believe that another layer of government uh, would put, would provide for uh, another layer of uh, probably management and travel expenses that the entire new borough would, would need to share and manage. Um, and I think between the school districts and, and the communities, I think it creates a lot of insert, uncertainty um, for their funding, so uh, they're obviously concerned. Um, and that, that's what I wanted to prepare, and uh, I hope uh, we just wanted to endorse the resolution that you're, con you're considering today. Okay, and I'm sorry, your name again for that? I'm Matthew McDaniel. Matthew McDaniel, and, uh, and you travel here on behalf of Chugach Alaska Corp? I travel on behalf of Chugach Alaska Corp and the villages within Chugach Alaska Corp, which are Tatilic, Chiniga, um, and then I'm a former director for EAC Corporation. They're within our region, but I have a, a letter of non-support for this. Okay, well, thank you for making the trip here and I uh, very much appreciate you keeping within the three minute time limit. Let it, let it, and I uh, appreciate your comments. So there is an opportunity at the end of the agenda as well for comments if you'd like to say more there. So. Okay. All right, thank you, thank you very much. Uh -huh. and, uh, and yet, like I said, you can give the clerk copies of those. So. And we'll get in a correspondence. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Sure. All right. Um, other uh, audience comments on agenda items? Yeah. Top of the three or four arc item on drive. Uh, first off, it's uh, for Dick Groff there. That's great, he's getting the recognition, and I'd just like to say, when I was with him with my son, and Hunter Safety did an outstanding job, and it's a lifelong lesson for him. And uh, I saw it pay off in the field one time, and I just <clears throat> go back to that, and thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to offer support for, under ordinance of resolutions for 18, 19, 20, and 21. I think doing infrastructure in this community is a high priority, and is, you know, years and years of lasting results. Also, I'd like to discuss on uh, new and miscellaneous business, the land disposal for Power Creek Lot 1, USS 4606. <clears throat> I'm real familiar with this. This came up a couple years ago. And reading through the, the paperwork, I can't find the answers. I mean, the reason it got kicked back before was the, um, this lot is kind of the cornerstone for access to the rest of that city property. And you don't have to take my word on it. I think you all know Don Showstead, and Don and I looked at this urban development like 20 years ago. And if there's an expert in town, I think Don will be the one, and he'll tell you this is the access for this property. And in fact, I bumped into him today, and I said, Don, I'm going to be talking about you. I said they want to sell that lot again without really, to my knowledge, unless they've done it with, uh, without securing a good easement and right away through there. The first thing he says, well, why would they want to cork off the rest of that property? So you need about a 60-foot easement for a road, and the mayor knows a lot about this. You've got utilities. You've got to have enough room to swing your equipment. You, you can't be on people's property. You can't have an easement. You can't have somebody go in there and buy that lot and then, you know, cut a, a straight bank 
And then, well, there's your easement. You know, the way that, that property is down there, it starts slow by Terry Long's house and it gradually goes up. And if somebody were ever to develop that, you could start there, go up, and there's about six home sites you could get up in there. So if you're gonna sell it, spend a little bit of money, find out where your, your road or uh, state right away is, and make sure you've got enough easement in there to put a road in and that you're not gonna get blocked off. Stake it out, and then if there's room, sell it to them. Um, it's kind of ironic we're spending about $125,000 on a comprehensive plan, but we're doing absolutely no planning on this property. We're just selling it. So let's take a look at it and make sure. Um, as an interesting note, Councilman, uh, I lose your name, Jones, you know, the subdivision that you live in, they put that in and they did not meet the state requirements for access to the Power Creek Road. So for several years, the developer and the homeowners had to pay for snow plowing and maintenance. And the issue was is that you have to have enough, a flat, enough flat grade to access the state road. It's not like a driveway. So this is critical to having the right amount of easement, right amount of road. The only thing that changed that is when uh, uh, Copper River Watershed went in and redid that culvert, then they found out with the surveyor that that road was in the wrong place. So they actually had, uh, Sam could tell you it was 20 or 34 mile foot. That was enough to get that satisfied requirements. Otherwise, you guys would be plowing that road. I bring that up because it's so critical to make sure that you've got the room to develop the rest of that property. And that's all, I sell it if you can, but make sure you've got that access to that point. And uh, you know, the surveyors have been down here for Cordova Electric. Uh, when they're here for maybe 800 bucks, they could throw some stakes in. You could measure off, right, there's your right of way. You need X amount more feet. Uh, let's set this property aside, and then if you want to develop the rest, do it. So I, I'd recommend caution on just selling it without a plan. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, are there audience comments regarding agenda items? Catherine Mead, uh, 104 West Davis Street. Uh, I wanted to, um, on the agenda item of proclamation appreciation of Richard Groff, he already knew he read it. So, <laughs> uh, we were trying to keep it a really good secret. Um, this is just a small list of, of the wonderful things that he's done throughout the years. And one thing that I thought uh, should be totally mentioned is he is the driving force behind the CBFD Constitution, bylaws, and municipal code updates that uh, the city council, uh, mayor, and city manager uh, know about. And he has, he, he is an amazing person and it's just, he knows how to get things done. So I just wanted to add that in and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Other audience comments regarding agenda items? Okay, um, we'll move on to uh, chairpersons and representatives of boards and commissions, uh, CCMC. Oh, good evening again. Um, there's been quite a few positive things going on at the hospital over the last couple of months or so. Uh, the first off, I want to um, welcome Randall Draney, who was sitting beside of me back there, as our new Chief Financial Officer for CCMC. Uh, he's a, a permanent hire. We had had an interim in there for six, eight months or so, and Randall started towards the end of December, so he's still getting his feet wet and learning everything, so really uh, looking forward to uh, him coming on board and helping us uh, with the, the financial management side of things. Back in December, uh, the nursing home had its um, annual recertification survey from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Service. So this is something that we have every year. And it, um, it was a lot different this year because there were uh, a lot of new regulations that went into effect for the nursing home uh, within the past year. 
and uh, we've made some major strides over the last couple of years. Um, they do now three different surveys when they're here. Uh, one is a health survey, which is what the nurses do, the doctors do, and everything. Uh, they do what's called a life safety code survey. That's where they look at everything from you know, our exits, uh, fire drills, and things like that. And then now, for the first time, we also had an emergency preparedness survey. So this is the first time we've had that. Uh, this year, we actually have reduced the number of health deficiencies uh, to the lowest level ever. Uh, two years ago, we had 21 deficiencies um, on the nursing home side. Last year, we had 13. This time, we had two. The surveyors told us that this was the best survey that CCMC has ever had. Uh, so the work that we've been putting into to try to improve the quality um, is making an impact. Uh, those two deficiencies were both policy related. There were absolutely no deficiencies with uh, any patient or resident care. Uh, we had one policy they wanted us to add something to and another policy they wanted us to expand a little bit on our facility assessment. So I wanna thank the hospital staff for what they've been doing to make these big improvements over the last couple of years. Uh, we're continuing to look at adding additional services for the people of Cordova. Uh, we have uh, recently entered into an agreement to bring a new pediatrician to the clinic at CCMC. Uh, we don't have the first date yet set, but it will probably be before the end of the first quarter of 2019. And uh, the plan is at least once a quarter thereafter, but if the demand from the patients is high enough, uh, we might be able to bring them in once every month, every other month. Uh, so we're continuing to add that. Uh, we're also working with um, reaching out to a podiatrist uh, who has an interest in coming to Cordova as well. So that's a fairly early uh, process that we're working on there. Uh, other services, we have a new part-time occupational therapist that will be coming to the facility uh, for the first time this weekend and she will be doing uh, care for the nursing home residents as well as people within the community as well. Uh, we have a speech therapist that um, has been coming for uh, a couple of months now and we're looking at um, expanding that service so that uh, we can add uh, additional uh, days that that person can come here and provide speech therapy services as well. Uh, you've probably heard that we've recently started offering sleep studies uh, through the clinic, and those are the home sleep study um, types. So it's a small device that uh, the, the staff at the clinic will teach you how to, to wear it. You go home, sleep at night, come back, bring it back the next day, and then we have a neurologist in Anchorage that actually it reads and interprets the results of that to determine if there's any other type of services um, or healthcare services that you might need from that. Uh, we have mentioned before that we've also started doing durable medical equipment services, which uh, we're doing through a contract. Uh, the hospital does not have a license to offer DME, so we've not been able to actually bill for the DME equipment that we've been giving away for decades. Um, so that will help us in a way that we don't have to now give away uh, uh, you know, supplies and equipment that we can't bill for. So we're continuing to make improvements and that's all I have, unless there are any questions for me. Any questions, Council? Okay, well, uh, thank you for your report and congratulations on the um, survey. And uh, welcome, Randall. I think you'll find it's hard not to get your feet wet in Cordova. <laughs> uh, school board? Is meeting tonight and so is CTC, I think, so. Uh, we still have a good crowd here. Um, so Council, uh, Tom Baylor is your representative on the uh, PISWAC uh, Board of Directors. There have been quite a few items there recently, so um, I've, uh, I'll ask him for an update and report. And thank you, Tom, for um, the recent reports and stuff here on Prince and Sound Impacts. And I'll give these to Susan so they're available to Council. Oh, they're passed out to Council. Okay, everyone. Oh, great, thank you. And then you also see this other one, I think I only gave her one. 
Yeah. I put a link to both of those reports. Yeah, there you go. On the page. Okay. And I was thinking also, you know, again, doing the comp plan is probably some good information to include on the, you know, the, what this means to this community and Prince William Sound. Yeah. Uh, so that's just a quick update. Yeah, both of these got some really good information on it. We got these in the uh, uh, fall meeting up in Anchorage. Um, and then something on it, Kenny, do you know when the, Kenny's on the board, do you know when the spring meeting is? I don't. First week of March. <laughs> First is gonna be here in Cordova. Right. First week of March, I can't remember the exact date, either the fifth or the sixth. So I wanted to bring that to your attention because normally we have the fall meeting in Cordova and the spring <coughs> meeting in Anchorage. And uh, this year, because of the Board of Fish issues, um, which was a real threat to Cordova, and Ken could probably tell you more about that. Um, we had the meeting in Anchorage. Uh, so then they were gonna schedule the meeting in Anchorage for spring, and Mr. Jones spoke up and go, wait a minute, that's not the deal. You guys promised us one meeting in Cordova. So if it was not for Mr. Jones speaking up, you wouldn't have 50 people coming here this spring. So with that, I hope that you know the drill, Mayor, as far as getting a chamber on board, make sure we got some restaurants and people recognize that, and maybe run some of the welcoming mat out to them and, and uh, take care of them because I'm sure they'd rather be in Anchorage. It actually had to go to a vote to come here. So it was pretty impressive that, you know, Kenny brought up and other members of the Cordova on the board uh, bought that. Uh, also with that, you know, being said, there's two positions there. We have the Casey Campbell, and then I think Casey Pate, production manager, is, is correct? He's the uh, operations manager. Operations manager. And so neither of those positions right now are full-time residents of Cordova, which is, kind of sad and um, I don't know if we don't have any influences on that, but it'd be good to kind of keep an eye on that and talk to your local representatives on the boards. On the on the uh, executive committee who, what is there, there's 45 people on the board, I think? 45 or 47. Yeah, so you can imagine this, <laughs> you guys trying to get something that was seven. Um, it's a rather large board. And I think there's about 15 of them that are from Cordova, so that, and that's good. That helps keep that Cordova interest in. But more importantly, the executive committee, which actually does most of the work, uh, there's seven. And on that, uh, Mike Babick is on. Well, I'll run through the list. Tim Moore, who lives, in, I think, in Homebrook, but Mike Babick, uh, Ty Losey, Tom Carpenter, and Darren Gilman are all on the executive committee, and uh, Ken Jones is on uh, alternate. And that's real important because they do most of the lines work. You know, so we've got a good representation of Cordova on that board uh, to keep our interest out in front, as well as fishing interest. But I believe Cordova started this, and uh, you know, it, it could slip away from us if we don't keep an eye on it. So uh, get to know who your board members are, speak with them, especially if you're a commercial fisherman, it's in your best interest, and then in the community and the mayor. So uh, anyway, look forward to the spring meeting. Any questions? Thanks. Okay, Commissioner Council. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And, um, and Councilman Jones, I know you also are working on um, seeing if, uh, trying to get UFA's um, annual meeting in Cordova. And I just got an email this afternoon. They voted to hold it in Ketchikan uh, because Cordova and Ketchikan were the, uh, the final uh, decision. But um, they, she said they held it, they voted to do that because they never had one in Ketchikan and they have had one in Cordova, but they're looking at Cordova for the following year, so. Those, uh, those meetings here, 50 to 100 uh, uh, people are really important to our economy. So appreciate you guys working on, on those. So. Uh, we don't have a student council representative tonight. Um, so um, have approval of the consent calendar. Does any council want to remove any specific items? Seeing uh, Councilman Jones. I guess I would just um, on number five, uh, with it being an ordinance, would that be more appropriate to have that be a uh, off a consent calendar. For first reading, uh, they can actually ban there for both readings because they're roll calls, but it's up to you. Okay. And then did we want to do um, item eight separately for to Yeah, once, once it's approved, then we'll actually execute that. So okay. Do that. Good questions. Okay, uh, roll call. So on the full consent calendar, mm -hmm. uh, David Allison. Yes. Melina Meyer? Yes. Ken Jones? Yes. Jeff Gard is absent. James Weiss? Yes. Burton and Schaefer are absent, but the consent calendar is approved. 
Okay, um, with that, I'd like to uh, go to uh, item eight on the consent calendar and um, read the proclamation uh, into the record. And uh, we don't have uh, Emily here tonight, so I would invite, do we have a portable microphone actually? It makes this easier. And uh, I'd invite uh, Mr. Groff up to join me. And uh, if some of your colleagues would like to take a couple pictures, we'll have that opportunity. <coughs> What is it? Oh, you took me to get that? Thank you. I would sure you do business on the Constitution and bylaws. <laughs> <laughs> you look what you fell into. Okay, uh, Mr. Groff, if you just join me here. I'd like to read this proclamation of appreciation uh, to you, Richard Groff, on behalf of the city of Cordova, Alaska. I am Mayor Clay Copeland. Do hereby issue this proclamation of appreciation to Dick Groff for his 45 years of invaluable contributions to the citizens and city of Cordova as member of the Cordova Volunteer Fire Department and as a dedicated and involved volunteer in varied other posts within Cordova. Whereas Dick moved to Cordova for employment with the United States Forest Service in 1974 and quickly involved himself in community activities. And whereas, he became one of the first in the state to receive the, to receive the designation of certified firefighter in 1979, and he was appointed assistant chief of the Cordova Volunteer Fire Department in 1982. And whereas, Dick helped establish the statewide Firefighter One curriculum, which is still used today, and over his tenure has trained thousands of firefighters across the state of Alaska, and whereas he has held several positions in the Cordova Volunteer Fire Department, the State Firefighters Association, and as a recipient of the prestigious Del Moffat Award for outstanding performance as a firefighter, and whereas Dick was in instrumental in developing the Explorer Post within the Cordova Volunteer Fire Department, which continues to thrive and attract the youth of today to serve our community. And whereas, Dick now serves the Cordova Volunteer Fire Department as safety officer, and since September 11th, 2001, has taught countless disaster management classes, and in 2012 was instrumental in the response to snowpocalypse in Cordova. And whereas, he received search and rescue technician level three certification in 2016, has been providing CERT training to the community for years and received a special commendation for a life-saving effort in a drug overdose case in 2004. And whereas Dick's, Dick has been a driving force during several Alaska Shield operations exercises and at age 83 is believed to be the oldest active firefighter in the state of Alaska. And whereas Dick has served and continues service to the community in various other ways, as a city council member, as a vice mayor, as a health services board member, he volunteers on the Cordova Trap and Gun Club, Amateur Ham Radio Club, Cordova Community Baptist Church Board of Deacons, and he assists with hunter safety training. Now therefore be it proclaimed that the mayor, the city council, and the citizens of Cordova hereby express our sincerest appreciation to you, Richard Groff, for your longtime devotion as a volunteer serving the Cordova Volunteer Fire Department and for your overall dedication and involvement as a citizen of Cordova. Your life is truly a perfect example of thriving through service to one's community. Signed the 16th day of January, 2019. Thank you. I just want to add on a personal note, um, like the citizen uh, said at the beginning of the meeting, that's the short list. And uh, I just want to personally, uh, you know, you look up 
community service in the dictionary. And that's that's the kind of picture you see of Dick. And uh, it was my second week in Cordoba when our, we had a house fire that totaled the house. And uh, I just, uh, I still to this day cannot believe the professionalism and quality of our volunteer fire department. They're really a model for the state. And, uh, and Dick has been a huge driving force and uh, a reason behind that. So uh, we have a lot to be proud of and it's one of the reasons we're as safe and, um, and as well taken care of as we are as a community. So thank you. Amen. Uh, approval of the minutes, we have none at this meeting. Um, consideration of bids. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I move to approve uh, manager to negotiate with Wilson Construction for the city shop roof replacement. We have a motion and a second uh, discussion. Uh, Councilman Jones? I think it's a, it's a good thing to invest in our upkeep in our buildings. We have a few prime examples of when we don't do that in our community, uh, right next door to this building. And uh, I think it's, yeah, the roof needs replaced, needs replaced, and we need to keep on top of maintenance. Okay. Other discussion, Council? Let's see what the company get the bid. Okay. Other discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Your motion carries. Uh, reports to officers. Um, I have a written report uh, for this evening. I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, any questions? Um, maybe I will just add, because this is a little more recent. Um, I, um, we didn't get it on the agenda quickly enough, but I'll be writing a letter of support for um, uh, Mr. Ruffner to the Board of Fish. Uh, he's represented uh, commercial fishing interests well on that board. So I'll be getting that out here before the next regular council meeting. Um, I'll also mention, I'll mention that I'll be um, traveling for business the next regular council meeting. So I'll ask uh, uh, Vice Mayor um, uh, Allison to uh, chair that meeting. And uh, also um, I've been working with the uh, Cordova Fisheries Development uh, Committee on this Tanner Crab announcement and that uh, very short seven day window. And I tentatively got a meeting with uh, Representative Stutes and her chief of staff and the new commissioner of Fish and Game and, um, and the director of Comfish, uh, Forrest Bowers and shellfish biologist Jan uh, Rumble uh, next um, week. And that'll be a fairly small meeting and we'll request kind of a, several things. But anyway, it's also an opportunity to have a broader conversation about fisheries management and the socioeconomic importance of um, sustainable commercial fisheries and opportunities for our community. So is there any questions or uh, Councilman Jones? I would just say with the, uh, you know, the letter of support for Robert Ruffner's reappointment, um, he was paramount in the effort to have the uh, 2020 Board of Fish meeting move back to Cordova. The uh, board actually voted to hold that meeting in Anchorage and uh, I arrived a little late to that board meeting in Anchorage this fall. And uh, when I realized that the decision had already been made on the next break, I immediately got on the horn with him and uh, pushed him to make a motion of reconsideration on that previous decision. And he made the motion seconded by John Jensen and, uh, and then with uh, Mr. Kane and Mr. Payton. They moved. They voted to hold the meeting in Cordova. So, um, yeah, I just really appreciated his efforts on that, and I think the whole community can thank him for that. For those reasons, I would like to see him, um, you know, reappointed. And and he's not actually a commercial fisherman. He, he's a biologist, and so he's kind of a level head, and he does things with factual based, you know, evidence based management. And that's uh, a lot of the arguments we have are passion and opinion driven and he brings a level head to the board and and uh, I think he's really good really good guy to keep on there okay thanks um, managers report well this is a couple of catch-up weeks as well being back from Christmas and New Year's and um, <clears throat> with with Dean on board I uh, I don't know exactly the time frame but I I hope to have some comprehensive financial reporting 
that we've talked about for a long time, including uh, our fund balances, changes in the way we report in our budget with uh, different information on the bottom line, uh, fund balances, restricted funds, available funds, those kinds of things. Hope to have uh, the structure of a, an E911 plan moving forward with you, the next steps that we're gonna take regarding that. Uh, we're gonna do our improved financial reporting uh, confident in, in conjunction with what CCMC is doing so that you get a complete financial picture of the two entities together. And then of course, I think as the new year unfolds here, we need to have a couple of discussions that we've talked about often over the last two years in the strategic plan. One is taxes and uh, what those look like or don't look like in the coming years and some uh, organizational issues within uh, our structure moving forward on those. I've given you the hint of some thoughts that I had. We have several staff that we're engaged in some conversations right now. Hope to complete that in a while here and at least give you a format that we can talk about. So with that, I'll answer any questions. Any questions, Council? Hey, uh, hearing none, uh, clerk's report. Um, I just gave you a little written report about um, some correspondence that I received. Um, and then I just wanted to say that I've been begun advertising for the election. The notices are posted and the ads have started. Um, and the declaration of candidacy is open until Tuesday, February 5th. Um, and there are several seats, three council seats, the mayor, um, two school board, three CCMC board seats. I think I had it wrong initially, so it's three. Two are full three-year terms, and one is a two-year seat just of somebody who had been appointed to fill a vacancy. Um, uh, all, 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 all the information is also available on the website. Um, absentee by mail applications are on the website, or anybody can email or call the clerk or city hall, or you can pick them up. And in person, absentee will start um, February 19th. To recap, but it's all available online, very easy to look at. Okay. Any uh, questions, Council? Okay, hearing none. Um, if correspondence is noted, then under ordinances and resolutions, uh, first to resolution 01-19-01, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Cordova, Alaska, declaring the eligibility of the City of Cordova to submit an application to the Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities for use of transportation alternatives programs funds set for by MAP 21 for this project Cordova Center Pedestrian Connector and declaring that the City of Cordova will commit to ownership and management and maintenance and operations of the project and authorizing the City Manager to sign the application and future project agreements. Move. So moved. <clears throat> I move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve. Uh, would you like to speak to your motion, Councilman Jones? Okay. Uh, any discussion, Council? Uh, I, I guess I would just just uh, echo the comments that were made by the public earlier that uh, it's a good investment when we can leverage our money 10 times. Uh, it's a pretty good investment for, for Cordova, so uh, worth a shot. Okay, any further, uh, Councilman Jones? Yeah, um, I guess one, I do have a question for staff. Um, I was curious if part of this project would be to um, construct a wheelchair accessible ramp on the bottom of the building. I know that's not, nope. no. Is there any way we can get that included? Would that make our, would it make it stronger for a project to have no. an ADA ramp in the bottom of the building? 
This project qualifies um, because there is ADA accessible entrances to both the pool and the Cordova Center. Um, so it wouldn't increase our odds on any, and we have no, it, it's too late now because they've given us a price okay. cost estimate. Okay. But we can put it on the next one. Okay. Okay. Um, any other uh, discussion, Council? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, resolution 01-19-02. A uh, resolution of the City Council of the City of Cordova, Alaska, authorizing expenditure of an amount not to exceed $41,825.10 to provide the required match for the Alaska Transportation Alternatives Program. Uh, grant Cordova Center Pedestrian Connector Project. Move to approve. Second. Have a motion and a second. You want to speak to your motion, Councilman Joe? Uh, like. Councilmember Allison um, said earlier, it's a no-brainer when you can leverage your money 10 times over to get these uh, infrastructure projects done that'll benefit our community. No further discussion, Council? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, your motion carries. Uh, resolution 01-19-03. I'm sorry, that was supposed to be a roll call vote. Oh, um, I forgot to. Yep. Sorry. Okay, so um, we'll have a roll call vote on resolution 01 19 02. Um, so it on item 19 there. Helena Meyer? Yes. Ken Jones? Yes. Ken Schaefer is absent. Jeff Gard is absent. David Allison? Yes. James Weiss? Yes. Motion carries four. Okay, thank you. Uh, resolution 01-19-03, um, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Cordova, Alaska, declaring the eligibility of the City of Cordova to submit an application to the Alaska Department of Transportation and Public Facilities for use of transportation alternative program funds set for, the, set for by MAP-21 for the project 7th Street ADA sidewalks and drainage improvements and that the City of Cordova will commit to ownership and management and maintenance and operation of the project and authorizing the City Manager to sign the application and future project agreements. I move to approve. Second. We have a motion uh, and a second. Uh, Councilman Meyer, would you like to speak to the motion? This is another one of those projects that we get a lot for our money and also improve the drainage with the sidewalks, I think is a nice combination there, so. Uh, further discussion, Council? Okay, hearing none, uh, this is a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Uh, resolution 01-19-04. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Cordova, Alaska, authorizing expenditure of an amount not to exceed $95,485.60 to provide the required match for the Alaska Transportation Alternatives Program a grant, 7th Street ADA Sidewalk and Drainage Improvements Project. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Um, would you like to speak to your motion? Same thing as before. Okay. Any further discussion, Council? Hearing none, uh, this will be a roll call vote. James Weiss? Yes. Ken Jones? Yes. Melina Meyer? Yes. And Schaefer is absent. David Allison? Yes. And Burton and Guard are absent. Motion carries 4 0. Okay, thank you. Um, Unfinished business, we have a performance deed of trust extension for Dan Nichols, lot two, block three. Um, CIP. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move to extend Dan Nichols' performance deed of trust uh, substantial completion date to um, December 30th, 2021. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, discussion, Councilman Jones? 
Yeah, he's uh, since the last time he was here for an extension, he's got his foundation done. He started erecting the building, ran into some issues with some permitting and, and then contractors leaving town. I think it's a no-brainer to extend this and to give him enough time to get the building completed. It's gonna grow the tax base in our community and provide uh, really much needed indoor workspace for bow pickers and also um, warehousing for one of our local grocers. So it's a no-brainer to extend this, in my opinion. Further discussion, council? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Uh, new and mis miscellaneous business. Have a land disposal for Power Creek Lot 1, U.S. Survey 4606. Move to approve. Have a motion? Second. And a second. Uh, Councilman Jones? Well, the last meeting I spoke in favor of disposing of this lot pretty heavily. Um, that can be reflected in the, the minutes online. Um, since that time, I've, um, you know, one looked at the location and, uh, and you know, hearing from different contractors around town about the other larger portion that this would provide access for. Um, I guess I might not be so so much in favor of, of uh, disposing of it without disposing of the larger piece with it, uh, just due to the access that we keep, you know, it's been brought up many times and um, really would like to, to grow our pie and to, you know, increase the amount of development happening around town, the amount of homes being built, that's a top priority of mine, but uh, I'd hate to see us block development of six home sites in exchange for one. Okay. Uh, you know, I should actually clarify the motion because I read the agenda item that I just wanted to clarify that your motion was to approve the disposal of that property. You have to make motion in the affirmative, right? Yeah. Okay. I thought so. So I got it. I just, well, I moved, right. so I moved to get it on the table. I, sure. I understand. Vote. I understand. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify for the record. So um, further discussion, council? Okay, all those in favor? Um, can we go back to discussion real quick? Because I, I will, yeah, I'll revert to discussion. Okay. Um, is it clear that when we put this out, that the access road was a question, and that if bids came in, they'd have to work with our land and planning to create that easement? Staff. Uh, no. So. Um, yeah, so no, when it went out, like when Mr. Baylor was talking about when it went out before, we did actually have an easement drawn in there and, and talked through that whole process during that time. When PNZ and City Council, when it moved through the process this time, that was it was discussed at the PNZ level. They said no, they didn't want to add that. And I, I'm sorry, but I can't quite remember if it was discussed at Council or not. So no, there was not any discussion on that. So this doesn't have any requirements for plan easement or working with our planning to establish where an easement would be if the lot behind it was sold. Correct. Okay. okay. Councilman Jones. I guess another, um, another problem I would have with the proposal would be that the lot in front of it is needed to provide access to the proposed house. Um, and that's proposal wasn't purchasing both lots, it was just purchasing the one behind. That's not our lot. So um, it, it was discussed in the proposal or in the RFP that that lot is unknown, believed to be DOT. There would have to be that little logistic has got to be worked out. And that would have to be worked out for any development on any portion of that. Mm -hmm. okay. So I guess I'm just wondering what we, what the options are for this proposal and the lot behind it. Can we amend this? It says it has to work with planning and zoning to establish that lot or 
He's not quite sure what you're trying to say. You mean the easement? The so easement, yes. The easement? Well, this is my opinion. I'm not sure if this is correct, but the RFP, I, I would almost think that would null and void the RFP because that was not a portion of the RFP. Um, I guess I would kind of defer that to somebody with more experience. I'm not sure. We could bring back what the the drawing and all the information that was presented the previous time this lot came out, you know, because there was an easement drawn on there and there was, you know, it, it really makes that lot a very different lot um, for you all to review, if you would like, and then uh, make a decision on the proposal. Okay. So kind of to summarize a recap, it was uh, RFP went out, um, a proposal was received. That's the structure that you have in front of you to vote on. And um, can't, can't really change that structure now because it was submitted and proposed the way it was advertised. Mm -hmm. You could ask for additional information, I guess, to make a decision. Councilman Weiss? I, I would be in favor of trying to find a like There's a local survey company trying to make sure that we have a way to get out there before, well, before we dispose of this. Yeah, that's that's not the action before council right now, though. Um, just as part of the discussion, I guess I don't feel comfortable um, moving forward with getting rid of this lot at this time without looking into a little bit more why the planning and zoning commission decided not to put that easement in the RFPP, or just to, for my own research, to look into this a little more. So if we were to vote on it tonight, I'd be voting no, unless we want to basically revert it back to staff so that we can have more time to look at it and maybe when more council members um, are here to be able to vote it yes, because I'll be voting no, how it stands. Yeah, so is that a motion to postpone or, or refer? Or? Sure, yeah. So. Okay, so we have a motion to postpone. Uh, refer. Refer. I'm sorry, refer back to staff. It sounds like uh, history and maybe uh, um, specifically on the easement and why it wasn't included. The easement is okay. where I'm coming from. So, any discussion on the uh, motion to refer? Yes, I think we have that clear. Yeah, I think we'll just bring back what was done in the past and the discussion that occurred during that time frame. Yeah, I can't quite remember if the surveyor did some of that work or not. And also just so that more council members are present so that. Okay. All right. Um, discussion on the motion to refer? Uh, yeah, I would, I would just also also add that one of our, one of our lot developers here is, he does express concern to the building on the lot. About or, you know, creating access to the Okay. Further discussion? Uh, all those in favor of referring? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, it'll be referred back to staff. Uh, City Council direction to staff regarding a draft resolution opposing the Prince William Sound Borough. I move to direct staff to draft a resolution opposing the UBS Borough. Is that what you're looking for? Or, um, so I thought we had a resolution in the packet. Not for action. Yeah, not yeah. for action though. For discussion, so and um, I discussed this. I just want to make sure that this is um, that council actually wants to consider that resolution uh, because um, you did expend money to uh, participate in a study, and I wanted to make sure that um, you had had a chance to see the results of that study and that uh, there was maybe a little more formal feedback from the review committee to council. And I apologize, I wasn't at that meeting, didn't attend the meeting when the committee kind of 
passed on their recommendations, but it didn't sound like there was a real clear recommendation. So uh, um, anyhow, so there's a motion to um, to direct staff to draft a resolution opposing Prince William Sound Borough. Uh, so, so do we have a? Is it on the table? Is there a second? No. If there's, if there's no second. A motion to yeah, to direct staff to um, um, draft. draft a resolution of opposition to the Prince William Sound Borough. So there's no second, and with the lack of a second, I'll die for a lack of a second. A second. Okay, so we have a second. Um, Councilman Jones, discussion. Well, we've heard from, um, I know they weren't timely for this packet, but many of the other communities in Prince William Sound oppose the formation of a borough. Many of our constituents oppose the creation of a borough. And uh, with the findings from the, uh, the study, I'm not convinced that it would be a good thing to spend any more money on. And uh, I also um, would like to point out to people that the party that brought this to us is not the governing, the advisory board of Girdwood. And that board itself has expressed some forms of opposition to forming a borough. Valdez has strongly opposed formation of a borough. And we have letters from Chiniga and Tatitlik Opposing a bro. So it's just Cordova and Whittier that haven't. And I uh, would just like to have us get on the record opposing the borough. Okay. No further discussion, Council? Uh, I just like to say that I see little to no support for the development of the borough. So I'll have reaction. Okay. No further discussion, Council? Um, I don't think that it would. I would like us to, if we're going to do a resolution that is against the borough, I'd like to have some reasonings why, um, or just state something that was in the study, because this borough talk comes up time and time again, and if it comes up in the future, I want a future council or uh, a commission to be able to have some more information to look in. Do, rather mm -hmm. than just reading all the reports, maybe just like our own little summary, maybe that's something that the commission can do. Because um, it's a lot if you're going to read through all of them. I mean, there was one done in the 80s and the 90s, and they're all 200 pages. This one's not quite as long, <clears throat> luckily, but it's a lot to just have to go through again. So if we're going to say that, I don't know, I just would like a summary coming from us a little bit. So, um, Councilman Meyer, if I Good, uh, that might be um, good direction. I mean, that could be part of the direction to staff is that uh, when the resolution's drafted, it usually has whereas's and stuff. And those, those will kind of capture the council's thoughts. And so like, you know, what I'll, what I'll try to do for council before the next meeting is get some kind of formal, uh, um, or at least a summary of the um, advisory committee's um, points, maybe four or minus, and, and then just a, a recommendation from them. And um, you don't have to include that in the resolution, but at least you'd have those whereas, whereas such and such study on such and such date indicates this or that. And then um, when council drafts that resolution of opposition, then there's just some bases included in it. Yeah. Where, whereas the citizens um, and all the public testimony or whatever, and the, and the results of the survey or whatever. So if that sounds good. Uh, uh, Councilman Jones. So it was not uh, timely to make it into this packet, but I did forward on um, some ideas for whereas is uh, in a draft resolution to Alan and Susan. Um, so they were pretty pointed comments in opposition. And uh, so I'm not sure if the rest of council would be in support of this type of language. Um, one thing I might suggest is maybe we could have a workshop on this to pin down our whereas's for a joint work session with the committee. So we make sure that it's what we really want to have brought forward when we vote on it, instead of keeping referring it back to staff a million times until we get our whereas's right. Let's just, you know, have a work work session on this and then we can pinpoint the exact whereas's. Because I know I would, I would prefer to have um, a little bit more 
teeth to it than the one in the packet, but uh, I'm one of seven, so. Okay, um, maybe we can, um, after we vote on that action you have in front of you, maybe we can, under pending agenda, identify which meeting we wanna have a work session. And uh, then maybe use that as a use that as a template, and at least councilmen then can bring their thoughts. And um, it's, I appreciate that. That's exactly why I didn't want to put that on the agenda, so that we end up trying to, um, you know, basically draft a resolution during the council meeting. So I'm trying to figure out how to approach that. So a work session might be the way, or staff well, draft. It'd be one. easy with seven trying to write yeah, a resolution. Exactly. But so um, we need to get there somehow. So. But this is the first step, I guess. So other discussion on um, the motion to uh, draft a resolution opposing Councilman Allison. Yeah, I, I don't really have any heartburn one way or the other over over resolution. Resolutions are, um, it's gonna make some people feel good, but it really doesn't ever gonna have any teeth to it as we've seen other resolutions. Uh, putting money into the permanent fund, for example, for a certain purpose and not following through with that. And, uh, anyway, um, I don't have a, a problem with, once we get something, then debating the whereas is in the now therefore and such like that. But uh, um, again, I guess, you know, in, in three months, this council could be completely different with a new mayor, and three new council members, and, and they're gonna do what they wanna do at that point in time. Uh, anyway, uh, proclamations, on the other hand, neighbor are hard to come by. And <laughs> congratulations to, to Dick there. But uh, anyway, I don't have a problem putting on the, uh, on the future agenda or the next agenda to to discuss and, and debate and talk all about it and we'll put our stamp on it. Okay, so I think, I think I heard everyone, all the councilmen in favor or semi in favor with some qualifications on, on this. Is there any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. So it fails. So I missed it already oh. because are we draft, uh, are you, is staff drafting a resolution or are we having a work session? Well, um, so we're not <coughs> directing staff to draft a resolution of opposition with, um, no. well, let me see. So we have an agenda of count, we have a, um, we have a majority of council present. So is that a pass then? That doesn't resolution. require a majority. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Requires so, the motion, so the motion carries. So, and I think what I heard was a suggestion that uh, rather than draft it on the fly, that we have a work session, hash it out. Help so, draft it. Um, so uh, that segues right into our next agenda item, which is pending agenda. I think you voted on being in favor of having this in a work session to draft a resolution of opposition. I think yeah, that's so we're going to have a work session to come up with our whereas's, and then yes. and then you guys will draft final. Okay. So I thought that's what we we're voting on. So, uh, Susan, if I could just ask you, do we? Did you email that draft out yet? I don't recall. Okay, so if you could do that, at least that's a starting point. And then, um, did you want to council? Did you want to take that up on the a workshop on the February agenda, first meeting? Hang on, but no, because um, if theirs is happening, theirs is better for the majority of people. That's that's right. Place. We have a work session. Um, Tentative work session for the bear discussion that council had requested with the external partners that you requested to be there. So, so maybe the second February. Do we have anything yet for the second February? I, I don't auditors, know. maybe. I was just thinking. Dean of was going to talk to auditors. Yeah, I just don't. I, I don't know dates on auditors, and we're going to have UBS come back. Um, oh wait, UBS. I would uh, I would prefer to be voting on it by the second February meeting, just because March gets hairy for my schedule. But I mean, that's up to the. We can we can just tentatively put it on that second meeting of February, and uh, and we'll have another bite at that on the first meeting of February. 
meetings. I, I think at this, at some juncture here, it's it's important to have Leif here because he has obviously been through all the meetings, been to all the meetings, listened to all the data, and you know, um, what I heard in my last conversation with Leif was after the presentation they had uh, from Information Insights that uh, uh, very lightly attended. Well, he was quite surprised by the numbers. Okay. And, and I think that information is important as you come to a conclusion uh, about where you want to go with this. I, I hope that you're, you know, that we, what I've tried to do from the beginning is not make a judgment based upon the lack of fact. Yeah. That we want all the facts and that we want, as, as Melina said, we want some hard facts, bullet so, points of why we, we oppose. So what I su would suggest is maybe a staff report that goes into the first February meeting agenda, that kind of s where you can summarize those in a memo to council. I'll try to get something similar from the uh, advisory committee then you'll have that in your pocket as you go into the work session on that. And remember, we've tried to preserve jumping off points here without spending any more money. Exactly. We've already spent money. Let's get the conclusion of that. I would recommend let's get the conclusion of that data. And if the decision point comes to you at any time before that, you, you have the ability to say no simply because you don't know the answers without jumping into something that's gonna cost you in this community anything. So preserving those jumping off points, I think re removes some of the urgency from it, in my opinion. Okay, um, Councilman Ellison. Oh, I was just gonna point out that first full week of March mm -hmm. is gonna be a busy one with PISWAC meetings the same week as the district basketball tournament which is going to be 16 teams and coaches and parents in town at the same time uh, and an election and an election and the council right. industry and when's the is that the regional tanner crab fishery starts, starts march, march first. first so anyway we can let the business owners know that they're the you know the restaurants and i'm not sure some of those teams i suppose will Maybe stay in hotels. I don't know. Some of them, uh, some of them may, some of them might not. But okay. I'm sure, the schools will be feeding them, but uh, they'll also like to go out too. I'm sure. So anyway, busy week. Yeah. They're probably out right now. They're all here for tip off right now. They're yeah, I think we'll feed them tonight. So. <laughs> Do we have other uh, pending agenda uh, items, uh, Council Yes, yeah, it was my understanding that we'd be uh, seeing the first reimbursement for uh, our pharmacy from CCMC soon. I'd like to have something put on where we make sure that makes it back into our front and not just respond to the general fund as it gets to us. Okay. So is there an agenda item that that needs or are you just kind of, I don't know. Probably just under the manager's report, right? Okay. So maybe just a <coughs> report. Yeah, maybe that would be a starting point okay. just to see if the reimbursements are coming back and then a recommendation on what to do with those. Is that a good start? Yeah, that's okay, great, thank you. Um, Jeff had asked me to say something about adding to a pending agenda access for people to get sand. You get what? Sand. Oh. Okay. Just saying. It's on the I, I, I told him today that I'd have it in the next agenda. Uh, he asked me about it last week. The issue is, as I understand it, the decision was made some time ago not to provide private individuals with sand at $5 a bucket because it was in competition with local contractors who had sand for sale. We didn't want to be in competition. That's how I understood the policy. I may be in error on that, but that's where it stands right now. So I indicated to Councilman uh, Guard that we would revisit that at the next meeting. 
to see if council wanted to make any change on that. It is on the fee schedule, however. It is. Uh, that wasn't a question, that was a comment. I, I know it is. Yeah. Um, Councilman Jones? I have a conflict of interest with this topic. So. <laughs> so, so if the councilman wants to buy his hand from the city, does he have a conflict? <laughs> to his uh, financial commitment. So, um, okay, so am I hearing you say that you're going to have something to comment on that? Or yeah, we'll or, have something. Okay. Maybe I'll pull Councilman Guard. There's, there's ways to get sand when you really yeah. want. <laughs> okay. So we are going to do the Bayer work session on the 6th. Yes, yeah. I think that's what I heard, Council. Uh, that's when we can have our fishing game. And then what did, what did you want to put on about... Um, Title Four or the drug policy or anything, or just put it on the pending agenda? Um, <coughs> yes. Let's just put it on the pending on agenda. It. Generally leave it there, and I think in the manager's report, we might have a suggestion on um, what to move forward with and how. Well, at the next meeting, you'll have an estimate from me on revising Chapter Four. Perfect. Um, any other um, pending agenda items? That's all I have. Okay. Um, audience participation. Are there audience comments? Uh, yeah. If you can just approach the um, um, podium here or <coughs> up here and just state your name for the record, please. I'm Tony Harrison, and I'm the one who's submitted the lot proposal for lot number one on the Power Creek Road. And um, I just wanted to, I was there at the planning meeting. Um, I was the only one there at the planning meeting <laughs> um, in the audience. And they, there was not discussion of, um, they discussed access to the larger lots. They went over all of the land disposal maps. Um, and uh, it wasn't determined that, that you needed that specific lot to get to the larger lot. Um, and it was, you know, all members approved going forward with the lot. So I'm not sure if that was taken into consideration uh, if anyone's thought of that um, here. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew that. Um, yeah, there's potential for other access to that larger piece. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, let's give a first of all, give a shout out to the police department. I was at the uh, ball games this last weekend, and a lot of people got there before it rained. And when I got there, the roads got bad. Uh, they did a public service announcement before everybody left. I thought that was pretty cool, and then. I have seen them out directing traffic at the corner there, which I really appreciate, but it was a nasty night. And for that guy to be out there in that blowing rain and, and to do that service, I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. So I really appreciate that. And offer, offer, let me give a little advice on moving forward on the Power Creek lot. And if you look down your packets on page 42, they kind of have a, a drawing there that supposedly would show, I believe, the state right away. And of course, these aren't always accurate. But my suggestion would be to, to catch a surveyor when he was in town. And there's, there's no rush on this. I mean, the, I think the initial plan was five years to get something built. But maybe this summer, the mayor's got a pretty good connection with the surveyor. I've used him, and he's the best reasonable rates that I've found out of anybody. Um, I think it's, is it Andretti um, Clay or? Um. Yeah, TWA. So yeah, the neighbor. I'm sorry, now they're an edge survey. Yes, and you do a real good job. We could just catch them when they're down here doing another survey. We didn't have to bring them in specifically for this. But I would suggest getting the setback on this. Where is the state right away? Have them put a couple pins in there so we know, and then you can take a look at that and measure it. All right, we're going to need approximately 60 foot. Can we get a, a road through here? And then once that's determined, then you could perhaps move forward with selling this lot if it's all feasible. But right now it's just a bunch of guesswork and there's this is the second person that's been interested in this. 
And it's just to give you some of the issues, I mean, if, if they're gonna use part of that state right away as a road access, you've got that house that's there now, well, his septic system's like way out on top of that, you know? So you've already got a conflict as far as putting the road in and using part of that right away to, to access that lot. So there's some issues, but I think to move forward, get it staked, it'd be six, seven, eight hundred bucks. Um, if you move forward selling it, add it to the price of the lot. We'd all know what's available and um, my thought process on this, if, if you could get somebody to punch a road in, let's say the punch a road into that first lot, let them build their house, but then the road would be there. And then if somebody wanted to buy the, you know, more, but they just keep continuing the road. I mean, that's the poor man's way of development. I don't think you're gonna get somebody to, in the next couple of years to develop that whole section there, but at least we would know. That would be the answers, and you guys would know, so we wouldn't have to be guessing on this. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Further audience participation? Yes. Dan Nichols, uh, still on Alder Street. I'd just like to thanks for the extension. Um, I don't know what to say. We, the contractor came down, started, the fire marshal came to town, and closed my job, cap dues, and whatever else. The initial thing was there wasn't a, a uh, permit for the foundation. The other contractor, it should have been in the shed, it wasn't. Uh, he had copies and that's why they initially shut them down and they found some other things. Contractor went to fire marshal several times trying to get back here and we finally figured out that fire marshal wants an architect to go through. How that encompasses uh, safety and fire, I don't know. Just like the foundation for me. Why is the fire marshal not involved in a concrete foundation? But anyway, I, I do have a feeling there's there, He's getting out there and he's fighting for money now because I believe our next governor's going to fight for eliminating some public services and I don't believe I'm not in the middle of that. I just, I, I can't see other, any other reason for it. Basically, the, I think it came down to the uh, mechanical room, which we had a little hand drawn thing. I know that John Harbaugh used it on Cam 2's building, used it on his building. Just, just It was just something very simple. Two bathrooms in the utility room, and uh, for some reason, they drawn the line, line in the sand and said, No longer is that too big. Now you have to have an architect. So I just got a bit from an architect I talked to him two weeks ago, $6,300. You know, I had to plan it for him, but you know, I was going to have that too. With the bar so, thank you, Council. So I've got a half a million dollars sitting down there. Not making me a nail. I really like to see that thing. Uh, uh, I, I pushed everybody as hard as I think I could push. Them. You know, let's get to that other point. I think those committees are not for you, they're against you. So, anyway, so thank Council for the extension. Okay. Well, thanks, Dan. I kind of heard something in the wind about that, and I didn't get the details, but those are the kind of things that we can. Um, ask our representative or senator to look into as well. I, I know John Harville's already phoned up and written several asking letters. Okay. Just because what happened at Camp Tuesday had, he had actually hired another firm to sit there and, and go through to take care of the fire marshal. The fire marshal came up, shut them down for I don't know what reason. By 10 o'clock the next <coughs> day, they're ready to go again. It was something that simple. Uh, yeah. This guy came through town and he, at the, at the motel, you know, our sprinkler heads are getting like 50 years. We we have Taylor come through, they do it, they hand the bar marshal report, okay. This guy came through and he came through and he says, I want that done and I think it was 10 days or two weeks, all the sprinkler heads changed out. That would have been the old bowling alley, 10,000 square foot the motel, all that stuff. I mean, all, they have that information the spring when he came through that he threw that at us so then we phoned taylor we said well this is what we need done he phoned the fire marshal and he got it put out until the spring when they come down to do it but, uh, it was just kind of that's the only thing i can figure 
Okay. That's that's why quite a lot. There's going to be a fight for money at the stage. Anyway, all right. That's my thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, further audience participation? Okay, seeing none, uh, council comments. I'll start to my left, uh, Councilman Weiss. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, congratulations to Dave Office going through a long list of uh, duties and services and accomplishments. I to reflect on a lot of these things that I and he, he taught my first firefighter one class and my first trauma technician class. He put me through hunter safety 20 years ago. Or, uh, yeah, just, just a huge thank you to him. And, uh, to, uh, in regards to uh, the power of it's, uh it's, it's not like we're not trying to get things built. We're just, we're just trying to look in the long term. We want somebody to have that a lot. We just plans plans a tough thing to come by and throw in. I don't think anybody here doesn't want to see that happen. It's uh, just more of a future restriction thing. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Councilman Jones. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, thanks, Mr. Groff, for all your years and years and years of service and all the things that you do. It's pretty amazing inspiration to us all and uh, yeah I echo the comments on the land disposal um, I don't want to keep anybody from building a house I just don't want to block our access for future houses as well so I'm sure there's some sort of a compromise that can be worked out we're just not quite there yet so hopefully we can get there and um, yeah thanks for putting up with me thank you uh, Councilman Allison yeah, thank everybody for coming. I appreciate the comments that uh, people have. Uh, congratulations to my, my neighbor, Mr. Drop, uh, back there, uh, well deserved. And uh, I'd just like to uh, uh, tell Mr. Nichols that uh, he gave you three years, but don't take that long. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> just like to pass along my. Uh, Concern for, for lack of a better word, I guess for for our local federal employees who who are out of work or working without pay. Um, don't want to get into politics at all uh, regarding that, but uh, hopefully we are making accommodations as as a city for for anybody who who might be you know having trouble paying the utility bill, which which they, they shouldn't at this point in time yet, but uh, certainly if this drags on, there, there could be some situations. Kodiak's been on the news a lot. Of course, they've got a lot bigger Coast Guard um, contingent than, than we do, but we have quite a quite a bit here as well. Yeah. I know there's organizing some, some dinners and fundraisers, and food banks, and I think the food bank and anchors is actually sending some food here too. So anyway, we want to take care of take care of our own as much as we can. Thank you. Yeah, Councilman Meyer. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, just echo all the comments that were made before me. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Council, I, uh, I was a little remiss and um, on the executive session, you moved to amend the agenda. But uh, however, um, we have a uh, facilitator from the Foraker group here that um, council commissioned to um, do some uh, coaching and development work with your two employees, uh, city manager and the clerk. And uh, I would entertain, um, so um, I would like, uh, while she's available here, to have an opportunity for her uh, to debrief uh, council on the process of that. And uh, there is a fiscal note um, associated with that. So I would entertain a motion to go into executive session to discuss matters, the immediate knowledge of which would clearly have an adverse effect upon the finances of the uh, government. So move. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.